Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to the start of another week, uh, which has been a, a very cold week for us here in Johannesburg. And I see some of the people there in Underberg and the Drakensberg had a lot of snow. Um, so <laughs> hopefully it warms up a bit and then we go into summer. Um, this morning, we're welcoming Rulof Boerta, Dr. Rulof Boerta, a very well-known economist, and I've attended some of his seminars and, and really enjoyed them. Rulof, Dr. Rulof, so welcome once again, and, and we look forward to, to listening to you. I always say it's so important for us that are involved in the property industry to know what is going on in the economy at, at all times. Um, it, it affects us going forward, so I really look forward to that. And then Liesl, Good seeing you again. Hello. Good morning, Kur. Yes, lovely to be with you again on this beautiful Monday morning. We have the best weather today. So, yeah, I was also following social media and everybody's posts. A lot of snow, a lot, a lot of cold weather this past weekend. So, you know, the sun is out. We are blessed to experience another beautiful day in this beautiful country of ours. Um, Dr. Rulof Boeta has been um, a, a friend and a colleague for many, many years. We have the utmost admiration for him. So grateful that we have you again this morning, Doc. Thank you for taking us through what's going on. I love the topic, post-pandemic recovery on track. It just is such a wonderful topic to see on the screen. So thank you for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, and your positivity with us this morning. So, over to you. Right. Um, th thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for the uh, brief and concise introduction. Always nice to be involved with Gravensteins. Um, this is uh, not the first time. Uh, I must tell you that uh, your timing is is uh, is difficult because we've just had <clears throat> one of the most horrible year uh, months, if not the most horrible month. Uh, in our country's history. Uh, I don't think any of um, the participants uh, can still believe what happened in July, uh, that, that uh, this country was capable of witnessing such scenes. But then I must tell you that if you do a bit of research, as I was asked to do immediately after the, the riots of July, into uh, was there, uh, was there, what, what, uh, what happened? You know, what caused this? Is, is, are there some parallels with some other countries? And to my amazement, I found that if you look at the uh, virus, virus Maplecroft survey of 130 countries in the world where they assess uh, political risk uh, and the potential for unrest, <laughs> they found that in 88, I'm going to repeat that, 88 out of the 130 countries had already or were bound to experience heightened socio-political and socio-economic conflict and disturbance this year. So we are certainly not alone. In Chile, for instance, um, the rioters destroyed 200 of Walmart's 400 retail outlets. Uh, and it was uh, not only confined to one province. Uh, or in our case, uh, you know, one or two places in Gauteng and, and also uh, in Natal, it wasn't throughout the whole province. So it was very specific. And in the words of our president, uh, we know who the perpetrators are. Because, you know, in this day of uh, this day of age, uh, by the way, this is my mobile phone, if you can see it. <laughs> and we're all in front of our computers, I suppose, or our phones or iPads, whatever the case may be. You cannot destroy evidence anymore. It's in the cloud. Uh, and I'm convinced that there will be more arrests, and I'm, I'm convinced that it won't happen again. Now, to talk about uh, the prospects of, of uh, the economy, for the economy this year after July, uh, there are, I think there are only two things more difficult to do. And those are trying to climb a cliff that is leaning towards you, or trying to kiss a lady that is leaning away from you. Uh, they are very intimidating, those two challenges. But I'm going to try nonetheless, and before I forget, my my central theme today, and and I'm taking this, I'm taking a leaf out of uh, uh, my book that I wrote last year, uh, preferably on this on this topic. Last year, in May, June, July, when I was invited to speak to a couple of audiences, remotely, obviously, uh, virtually, my message was: Do not get stuck in April. 
because April 2020 was probably, and I'll prove that shortly, much worse, much, much worse for the economy than July 2021. Um, and uh, uh, a journalist from uh, Media24 wrote an article in, in Farmers Weekly where he, where he said, Dr. Boota says, don't get stuck in April because there will be a, a subsequent month and another one and another one and things will recover. And that's exactly what happened. I predicted a V-shaped recovery and the recession of last year lasted one quarter uh, when most of my peers were predicting doom and gloom right up to 2023. You know that a, a pure optimist believes we live in the best of all possible worlds and a pure pessimist fears this is true. Um, we must remember that this country has survived onslaught after onslaught for literally hundreds of years. Uh, and we always manage to come out better and stronger on the other side. So uh, without further ado, let's have a quick look at whether this post-pandemic recovery is on track. I must tell you just uh, uh, once more, uh, a bit lightheartedly, that a friend of mine remarked, you know, with, with all this to uh, doing and throwing with the lockdown regulations, and then you can uh, you can buy stuff that you uh, <coughs> need to console yourself with a uh, little bit of a shot in the coffee now and then. Uh, it, it was very uh, disjointed in the beginning, the lockdown regulations and the way they handled that. And somebody told me that he gets the impression that some of these uh, command council members were so narrow-minded that when they look through a keyhole, they use both eyes. <laughs> but that's just uh, <clears throat> on a lighter note. Let's have a quick look at the reality. And I'm, I don't want to labor this point because all you need to do is to have a look at the newspapers or listen to the news quite regularly, depending on which station you're listening to or uh, and so on, to realize uh, we all appreciate the fact that we've had a decade of suboptimal growth. And as an introductory remark, I think what I'm going to say right now is incredibly important with a, a view to providing us with a more balanced and objective perspective of what is likely to happen the rest of this year and next year, and probably after that, at least in the medium term. And that is that we must not forget that a, a tremendous amount of this country's current problems and challenges are a result of a decade of state capture, corruption and theft under the Zuptas. And I think we all appreciate who they are. You've watched the Zondo Commission. Um, uh, our previous president has no regard for the law whatsoever. Um, he appointed the most incompetent bunch of crooks. And, and there's no other word for it to head most of our state-owned enterprises, the key ones. Uh, and he himself had one goal in mind, and that's to try to stay out of jail, which he didn't succeed uh, at. And, it, and President Ramaphosa cannot, him and his team, they cannot overturn this in one year or two years or three years, especially not if you get hit by COVID, by the worst pandemic in 100 years. So we, we have to be a little bit patient and we have to appreciate the fact that there has been more than 100 arrests. Some people have gone to jail. More will go to jail this year and next year. I've got no doubt about that. The National Prosecuting Agency is up and running again uh, and acting in the best interests of the country and not in the best interests of a couple of politicians anymore. This is behind us. And as we move into the future, we will see progress on that score. But we are paying a price for that because for a decade there was inadequate expenditure on infrastructure. Um, Employ employment started increasing again, uh, unemployment, especially because of COVID, uh, etc. Our fiscal balance has been stretched to the limit, and uh, etc. So we know what the challenges are. And I, I would like to quote the new head of ESCO. After a couple of weeks in the job, he said at a media conference, there is not one single problem at ESCO that cannot be solved. The, the rider, you have to read a little bit further, or listen a little bit further, that is conditional on government support, fiscal support, and competent people in charge of that institution. And that is happening already. And it's going to happen at a growing number of state-owned enterprises. So uh, we are on the right track, but uh, it's going to take a bit of time. Now, the exceptionally good news is that agriculture, remember, there is no substitute for food. You cannot eat your cell phone. 
uh, and South Africa's agriculture is flying high. The AGBIS IDC Index of Confidence in Agriculture has hit an, an all-time record high. Uh, we've seen, if you just look at the last decade, despite uh, the state capture, the value of output of key agricultural groups, all four of those key groups, has just uh, continued to increase. Our farmers, without a shred of fiscal assistance from our government, compared to 40% assistance in countries like, uh, in most countries in Western Europe, 45% in France. That's the kickback uh, on cost of production that farmers in other parts of the world get from their governments. Uh, in South Africa, zero. In fact, it's a negative rate of, uh, of assistance. Despite that, uh, they, they are, are still um, doing well. The, the, the sector as a whole's gross operating surplus is growing faster than the rest of the economy. There you can also clearly see that. And uh, our farmers, if, if you want to build a monument for somebody, you can build a, a monument for a farmer that, that gets up at four or five o'clock in the morning, winter and summer, uh, and make sure that we have food on our table. Well done to our farming sector. And by the way, our farming and processed food exports have also reached new record highs. So the impact of a receding pandemic. Now, the pandemic is not over. COVID is, is not going to disappear overnight, but we will be able to manage COVID in future. And as I said earlier, as we move into the future, its impact will become less and less. Uh, this is, uh, if, if Corin and Lisa had asked me to, um, because of time constraints, to only use five slides, <laughs> I would probably have chosen this as one of the five because, um, and I've written uh, extensively about this recently, those of you that get uh, Network 24, Media 24, um, the burger, uh, the build uh, this morning, my, my column is in, uh, that Salka uh, 24 uh, column, uh, I have to write that because I won that competition uh, a couple of years back. But this slide is, is so important. I've written about the super cycle. Now, a, a super cycle for commodities has only occurred four times in the last 120 years. Uh, and the upward trend, because remember, a, a commodity price cycle has an upward trend and then a downward trend, and that completes the cycle. And until a couple of years ago, most of the economists that study this terrain were of the opinion, and you can actually see that in the slide, there you can see from 2011 to 2020, there's a bit of a dipper that was also COVID-induced, but they were convinced that in 2010, 2011, the upward uh, phase of the fourth super cycle in, in a century had actually had started to go down. Uh, and I differed from them. And, and um, I don't always get it right, but when I do, I tell people, uh, but we are still very much on in, in the upward cycle. And that is such good news for South Africa. Also, good news is that our largest trading partners by value added exports is not China. All China buys from this country is iron ore and coal. They're not interested in the rest. But the US and the Euro area, they and, and Africa and Sub Saharan Africa, they buy high value added products. What I mean by that is chemicals, processed food, manufactured products. Um, engineering products, machinery and equipment, vehicles, components of vehicles, etc. Many of them manufactured, of course, um, also in the Port Elizabeth uh, and in the East area and, and the Eastern Cape. And this is exceptionally good news because if your trading partners are doing well, then you are bound to do well as, uh, on top of that. In the fourth quarter of last year, something which I predicted, our economy's total output was exactly the same in real terms as it was in the fourth quarter of 2019, before the pandemic. This is a remarkably swift recovery. And I, may, I have to add, not for all sectors. All the key sectors came to the party, but there are subsectors, tourism, hospitality. I think we all know exactly what I'm talking about, which have been hit exceptionally hard. Uh, and it will still take another quarter or two for them to fully recover. But with a bit of luck, with a little bit of luck, we will see droves of European uh, visitors, tourists visiting our shores uh, during our summer holiday season. That would be fantastic news, especially for employment creation. Now, uh, this slide is, is uh, extremely important to view from the perspective of April, May last year. 
in April, May last year, this benchmark uh, purchasing managers index, it's composite. So it, uh, it means services and manufacturing, which is arguably 85, more or less 85, 90% of the economy, depending on which country you're talking about. But South Africa is, is uh, more or less in line as far as that's concerned with our European trading partners. That took uh, its biggest dip ever in April, May last year. We all know why. And then it, it recovered quite spectacularly and it was at a much significantly higher level than it had been prior to the pandemic. And then came July. But if you look at July, which is still about 47, back to about 30, 32 and a half uh, in May, uh, we are still a hell of a lot better off. And from that point, from this July point onwards, especially with the relaxation of the lockdown regulations, because remember we got hit from all sides in July. We got hit with uh, the Arctic blast. <laughs> I think some of us remember that. Well, it was a cold winter and so and such a long winter. Uh, and then we had the riots and and, uh, and we throughout the whole of July, we had uh, uh, the lockdown, more stringent lockdown regulations. If we look at the APSA beer, our purchasing managers index, this is only for manufacturing, exactly the same trend, took a knock in July, still magnificently better than in April last year and likely to recover very quickly as well. So the message that I have is don't get stuck in July. Don't, uh, please don't think that July is our benchmark going forward. July was, as we say in Afrikaans, it's something which with a little bit of luck, very little bit of luck will never happen again. Uh, we should hope and pray for that, quite frankly. This is would have been one of my five slides if I'd been restricted to five slides without a shadow of doubt. This is South Africa's leading composite business cycle indicator, it's quarterly averages. And what I like about this slide, it tells us a little bit of a story about our recent history. There you have the Nene dismissal when we had a finance minister for a weekend. <laughs> I mean, uh, that will hopefully not happen again, a weekend special. Um, there was Ramaphosa's victory. Uh, an upturn that was that after the Nenet dismissal that was probably Gordon taking over finance again Department of Finance uh, then there was a bit of a disillusionment with the fact that things were uh, the economic, new, new economic policies that we'd been promised were slow in, in the making and then came COVID look where we are now an all time record uh, and this is uh, this is data of substance because it's a composite indicator it includes a lot of other key economic indicators. And if we take a look back to just prior to our first democratic elections in the beginning of 1994, and you look at this, the blue line is, is the leading business cycle indicator and the red line there is the per capita income trend in real terms, uh, which took a serious knock obviously in COVID and it is already recovering. And the two of them are correlated. So if the leading business cycle indicator moves to a record high, it will take another dip or two because of what happened in July, but it is bound to follow that track again. Then my common sense and uh, macroeconomics and econometric analysis tells me that per capita incomes will increase over the next couple of years without a shadow of doubt. And that, by the way, is good for property. It's good for everything in the economy, more or less. Our exchange rate, um, since 2020, um, took one hell of a knock in April last year. And since April 2020, the RAND has, has strengthened by 30%, but it will remain volatile. Uh, so be careful when it comes to foreign exchange, because the, the RAND's value is not only determined by what happens here in our economy and with politics, it's determined very much by what happens to the United States dollar and what happens in other parts of the world. It is still one of the 20 most traded currencies in the world. So it is bound to, uh, just like the Brazilian real, uh, the Turkish lira, South Korean won, Mexican peso also to experience a, a degree of volatility. The real effective exchange of the uh, exchange rate of the rand, if you compare it to its long-term average, this is now when you freeze out inflation and you compare it to a basket of currencies of our major trading partners, that is on its way back to uh, its long-term average and possibly also as has happened on three occasions since our democratic elections. 
overvalued territory. But the rand is still about 8% undervalued at this point in time. Um, here you can see uh, other currencies against the dollar between April last year and 31 May 2021. And the South African rand is numero uno. That's one of the reasons I have my 95 World Cup tie on. That's the first time we won the World Cup, not the last time. <laughs> uh, and we are still, uh, we still have the number one rugby side. I think the rugby matches of the last um, fortnight have been very good for our national psyche. Formal employment took one hell of a beating, just like happened in every other country of the world. And it's slowly but surely recovering. Those of you that saw the estimates of 10,000 jobs lost uh, in July because of the riots, uh, I'd just like to remind you that the overwhelming majority of those jobs are, have been lost temporarily. As those businesses recover, as those businesses are restocked, rebuilt, repaired, those jobs will be established again. And I can guarantee you there will be an increase, a substantial increase in the number of security industry jobs because one will have to, just for safety, make sure that there is more access, better access control, uh, etc. in future. So uh, that is only a temporary setback. Uh, the short-term insurance industry is doing exceptionally well. I don't know about uh, you guys and girls watching today, but uh, I try to drive as, as little as possible because I didn't want to end up in an accident or in hospital. And of course, with the uh, closure of some of the liquor outlets, they were that also assisted in much less accidents. So the short-term insurers, their premium income uh, took a bit of a knock. It still grew, but they did accommodate people to some extent, except when it came to the business interruption claims, they were a little bit sticky. Uh, but they've been um, clapped by the courts as far as that's concerned. But their claims, that gap between premiums received and claims uh, obviously uh, increased. And that's that's good news. And if your short-term insurance industry is in good shape, then that is a good sign for the economy in general. The value of building plans passed by larger municipalities increased. This is obviously good for the um, uh, longer-term uh, supply chain for property. Now, unfortunately, your buildings completed, as, uh, that has been a little bit lethargic, but also to a large extent because of the uh, pandemic and the lockdown restrictions. I mean, if you are working on a building site, uh, there's a lot of heavy breathing going on there. Uh, so uh, once somebody has COVID, the rest of them are probably going to stay away for quite a while. Uh, the value of sales of construction materials, this is exceptionally good news. There was a V-shaped recovery from April and it's moved to a slightly higher level. That is obviously good news. And then very good news, the AFRIMAT Construction Index. Anybody that believes that the construction in South Africa, construction sector is, is down and out on its knees because of the fact that a couple of listed companies uh, uh, have, have got financial problems or don't exist anymore is mistaken because what has happened to those skills in those in those large companies is they have moved out into medium and medium sized businesses but many of them are still available and especially if you move into if you travel in into informal settlements as i regularly do um, in in all provinces uh, you will notice a, a, an incredible amount of construction activity uh, on my last visit to um, natal to kzn uh, at Mshlanga, I counted 17, <coughs> 17 tower cranes that you could see with a naked eye. Uh, on my last trip to Tsanin, uh, I counted in just on a stretch of road between uh, Petersburg, which is now Polokwane, and Tsanin, uh, I counted 17 large hardware stores that you could see from the road. And I can guarantee you they do not complete stats essay surveys. <laughs> So construction is not down and out. If you don't believe me, after what I've just told you, go and have a look at Afrimat, a listed construction company. Go and look at their financial performance. Uh, it's unbelievable stuff. And that index, which is a composite index uh, consisting of nine key indicators of construction activity, which I compiled for them, that has also uh, done the V-shaped recovery. <clears throat> Bear in mind, of course, that these slides are one-dimensional. I try to be objective, as you've noticed. Uh, but it reminds me of the definition of a statistician uh, who is a person that will tell you if your head is in the oven and your feet are in the freezer on average you are quite comfortable 
Uh, I wouldn't try that, by the way. So here you have the FNB house price index, uh, hot off the press. I've just calculated the second quarter average, uh, which has reached its highest level in many years. Uh, but it will take a dip because of what happened in July. But still, once again, I mean, the V's, the V-shaped recoveries from just before the pandemic to the worst of the pandemic to where we are today is evident in virtually every single indicator, key indicator in South Africa. Uh, change in the average monthly value of mortgage advances, also moving back to where it should be in terms of its um, the, the amount, very close to double digit figures uh, on a monthly basis in billions of rand. I mean, that is not bad going. And this has obviously fueled demand in that sector. And then the JSE All Share Index reaches a new record high. The significance of this slide, plus the super cycles upward phase, which is still in motion, is that government has received such a bonus in the form of dividend tax. It's unbelievable. Uh, anybody out there that has directly or indirectly um, shares in resources companies, I'm not going to mention their names, but you can just follow the media on MoneyWeb and look at record dividends being paid by these companies. And of course, government takes 20% of that. You, you get 80%, which is, I suppose, not too bad. It could have been worse. Uh, but this has made it possible for government to extend the COVID relief and also to assist the businesses that were damaged uh, in, in the unprecedented and politically motivated uh, unrest that we had in July. Um, the index of new number of vehicles sold, also V-shaped recovery, household disposable income recovers, another V-shaped recovery, real salaries and wages, private consumption expenditure, you name it. It's a V-shaped recovery. Your real gross operating surplus for the finance and business sector has more than recovered on an annual basis, uh, fourth quarter of last year, and transport and communication almost at 100%. Here you can see some of the changes uh, of uh, commodities between the second quarter of 2020 and March this year. Uh, and many of our export products are in here. This is, these growth rates are spectacular. I mean, we're talking here about just below 10% right up to, uh, you know, doubling your money. Uh, th this is not bad going. Uh, and it's, it shows no signs of tapering off. It will take a little bit of a dip from time to time. Um, and our export growth is not confined to minerals and, and metals. It's also vehicles and components, also aggregate food, and also base metals and even chemicals as well. Your average monthly value of exports new all-time record high and predictably an all-time record high for our trade surplus. What this means is that we have fundamental balance of payment stability. What this means is that the RAND is likely, despite a bit of volatility, to retain its value against the dollar and other major currencies, which means that there is, except for some supply chain disruptions, the Reserve Bank uh, will probably keep interest rates exactly where they are because that is arguably the strongest driver of for the property sector. There you can see the value of exports and imports uh, for the first six months of the year. Now, uh, as you will notice, our imports until 2019, we had a, uh, not a large, but we had a, we had a significant trade deficit. Trade deficit. In other words, we were importing more than we were exporting. And then in 2020, it turned around. <laughs> Look what's happened now. I mean, <laughs> this is uh, quite incredible. I think in percentage terms, there's not a country in the world that can match us, quite frankly. And don't forget that platinum, rhodium and palladium have a huge role to play in making the world, the world's economy greener in the next decade or two. And South Africa is the biggest supplier of those products. So uh, they, we could be in for uh, huge growth in, in new embryonic industries in this country, especially in metal and mineral beneficiation. Um, and there you can see the best news possibly, and that is that the prime rate is at its lowest level in 50 years, 5-0. Uh, I, I don't think many of our uh, viewers today um, were around 50 years ago, uh, certainly not Gordon Liesel. I don't think their parents were around. That's a compliment, by the way. Uh, but I can remember that. Private sector credit extension, one of my few concerns is that, uh, and I hope somebody who has 
the ear of the Monetary Policy Committee, the Reserve Bank is listening or, or looking, uh, please tell them that there's scope for interest rate reductions as far as I'm concerned, because total private sector credit is still not coming to the party. GDP growth forecasts, I'm nearing the end. If you look at the Fin Media Economist, the year panel, they say uh, forecasting is uh, difficult, uh, especially about the future. Uh, but uh, these institutions, and I represent the Optimum Investment Group, um, that's where my, um, I shifted my pension to a couple of years ago uh, from UJ and, and, and some of my savings. If I'd done that five years earlier, I would have been able to uh, drive a Ford Mustang V8 today, but uh, better late than never. And if you, uh, And I'm usually the most optimistic forecaster, by the way, and now I'm number two. I, I'm going to have to have a word with Johan else at Old Mutual. Uh, and see what's happening there. But everybody uh, who knows their way around economics is expecting a bumper growth year, despite what happened in July. And I'd like you to remember that. Don't get bogged down in July. Look at the rest of this year and into 2022. Property market trends. Just a couple of, and I'm not going to elaborate this because I'm convinced that uh, most of you, if not all of you, have got access uh, to FMB's property barometers uh, and some research that I've done uh, uh, in addition to this. But uh, this, this makes for very good reading. Availability of credit um, will continue to support price uh, uh, growth. It's the, the loan to price ratio is, is currently the highest in 12 years. The banks are not as sticky as they used to be. And believe me, they can be sticky. I think we all appreciate that. Uh, time on the market is eight weeks compared to 13 week average long term. Uh, discount on asking price drops. Uh, this discount on asking price has declined to nine percent. The long-term average ten percent. So, yeah, that was the first quarter. It dropped further in the second quarter. State agent sentiment uh, was up in quarter one to seventy-five. It improved further. It'll take a dip in the third quarter. Make no mistake about that. But it'll probably recover back to that level, as far as I'm concerned. Their expectations. Uh, this is intriguing. If you look at the states, uh, this this um, indicator published by FNB, and you look at the lo lockdown restrictions, there's a definite correlation. Their activity rating out of a score of 10 at 6.6 .6 is still higher than the 10-year average. 60% uh, of agents were upbeat over affordable market growth for the rest of this year. That was now in the second quarter uh, survey conducted by FNB. And downgrading due to financial pressure remains the key reason for selling 21%. Uh, and that obviously ties into that 60% one as well. Selling due to immigration declined to its lowest level since 2017, 7%. Once again, there should be a, there'll probably be an uptick in July because of what happened. And then I'm convinced a lot of people will realize, but you know, um, look at the fires in the United States. Look at the uh, continued terrorism. The, the, the unrest in Chile has, has evolved into terrorism on a large scale. Uh, look at the unrest in those 88 out of 130 countries monitored by Vera's Maplecroft. Look at Kabul, uh, when the United States sends 1,000 of the highest trained soldiers in the world with the most advanced helicopters and other aircraft into a country to evacuate their embassy staff. Then you know <laughs> you must emigrate immediately. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen in South Africa, quite frankly. I think people will realize the grass is not necessarily greener on the other side. As a matter of fact, it may be quite scorched on the other side. So I don't think that is a, such a huge problem. As far as um, property market growth drivers are concerned, this hasn't happened in quite a while. We've had the lowest lending rate in 50 years. We've still got it. Accommodating monetary policy should continue. Inflation is under control. It's inside the Reserve Bank's target range, and it dipped uh, uh, last time around. BMIs uh, have recovered to above 50, except for what happened in July. They'll be back there. And this slide is very important. The shift in economic policy is not fully appreciated because of the fact that Mr. Ramaphosa still has to contend with about 30 percent, three zero, of the NEC members, the National Executive Council of the ANC's members, who are not on board, they are, they are still part of the Zupta clan. 
And the reason for that probably is because they were feeding from that trough and they know there may be some prima facie evidence out there of corruption, fraud, etc. So uh, they're not on board yet and he cannot just fire everybody overnight. Uh, there may be a huge revolt in the party and uh, if you know his personality, he would very much like this organization to stick together and slowly but surely weed out the rubbish, if I may call it that. <laughs> you can choose your own words. Uh, I've got some of my own very tasty ones, but I cannot repeat that uh, on, on this program. Um, and that's exactly what he said to the Zonu Commission a week ago. He said that the reason why he did not resign as Deputy State President prior to 2017 is because he realized that he's got more power to fight and combat corruption from inside. He's a smart person and he knows the only way to create jobs in this country on a meaningful scale is if you go operate with the private sector, which his predecessor didn't have a clue about. As a matter of fact, he's coined, his predecessor coined a new a, a, a numerative symbol uh, or, or expression, uh, 11 uh, Mr. Ramaphosa is a smart president and we should just give him a little bit of time. He is, they are just slowly but surely establishing master plans for cooperation between the private sector and government in every key sector of the economy. And now is the time for the private sector to come to the party and through their employer organizations and other fora to come and tell government, okay, these are the obstacles to growth. Let's try and do something about this. Uh, and, and with a bit of luck, we will. Visible signs of combating corruption, pent-up demand, redevelopment opportunities. I don't have to tell state agents about that. Um, Zoom town, forget about Zoom town. What about <laughs> Zoom room? <laughs> People are building Zoom rooms because the, the room that you use temporarily to do all this Zooming, etc., is not always conducive to privacy. You know, there are children, and in my case, grandchildren, and chickens, and cats, and dogs. So, uh, you know, you need to look at your property a little bit. Telecommuting is, is um, can create huge opportunities in, uh, in the property, in the construction industry as well. Temporary halt of immigration of highly skilled people. We are not, nobody wants uh, to just bring in droves of people from other countries of the world right now because every country in the world still is battling with high unemployment. And you can just imagine the political risk, let's say, Pick a country, France, South Korea, uh, Brazil, Australia, uh, the kind of political pressure that those governments will be under if they now, while they have higher unemployment, allow people from South Africa to come in. We are not that welcome as we used to be. Uh, we will probably be as we go into the future because we have a high work ethic, I like to believe, South African professionals. But right now, this is good news. Demographics. The European Union's chief economist recently said, that the ultimate driver of growth, and there's lots of caveats here, you need to have some infrastructure and you need to have some political stability and peace, etc. But the ultimate long-term growth driver is demographics. And let's face it, we've got that on our side. We are not going to become less people. We, our, our population is not going to decline. I can guarantee you that, uh, with or without COVID. Uh, as far as the economy as, as, as a whole is concerned, and this is my last slide, um, there's a bit of an overlap between the previous one because many of the growth drivers of property also holds for the economy in general. But there are still some additional issues here, and that is the super cycle. Uh, the prospects of higher growth this year and next year, I mean, that's a fait accompli. We will have between 4 and 6% real GDP growth this year. Employment will increase this year. It will increase further next year. Uh, our public debt is still manageable thanks to tax bonanzas, which are forthcoming uh, and have occurred, stable but, at, uh, but still very attractive bond yield, a large diversified and expanding tax base. Um, if we move down to the bottom of this list, our international global competitors ranking just prior to COVID, there haven't been a new ranking since then, uh, increased, improved from 67 to 60, and our currency is still number one in the world. Now, I must tell you that and despite all the problems we have, especially in the bureaucracy, um, the, uh, when Mr. Gigaba was Minister of Home Affairs, he had an international delegation visiting his offices here in Pretoria, and, and they asked him, very impressive building, by the way, uh, 17 stories, about 20 lifts uh, moving up and down. You just see people all over the place. 
they, they uh, asked him, how many people work here? And he thought for a while, he said about half of them, <laughs> which is probably an exaggeration. But despite our, our obvious problems uh, that we know about, uh, what we need to ask ourselves is, do we have the economic capacity? Do we have the capacity with economic policy now that we have that we are moving beyond the, the Zupta era to do something meaningful and positive about these problems and to create opportunities? Yes, the answer is a resounding yes. And I'm convinced that uh, as we move uh, into the next 18 months, despite you know the odd uh, hiccup, uh, things will. When I say things, I, I, I mean economic activity in every single sector of this economy will continue to increase. Thank you very much. Rudolf, thank you so much for, for that. Um, let's get the needle on there. Um, such interesting statistics, such wonderful statistics. I think in, in, the, in the last year or year and a half, it's just been bad news. But as you said, those are facts facing us. So. Uh, it's important for, for us property practitioners and the property professionals out there to know these stats, to be able to explain them to, to purchasers that might be not wanting to buy or might have some negative set sentiment. So thank you for that. Very interesting stats. And I'll, I'll definitely take some of those home and, 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 and use it in, in some talks and stuff that, that we do. So thank you very much for that. Very much appreciate it. Liesl? Yes, I can only second that, Cor. Thank you very much, Doc, for just always summarizing everything. While you were talking about Kabul, I was uh, listening to the news this morning and I heard one of the U.S. security advisors saying that at the end of the day, America cannot want security for Afghanistan more than what the Afghans wanted. And it just made me think about it. At the end of the day, we must want to help ourselves. We must understand our own microeconomics. Surely uh, macroeconomics are always extremely important, but so vital that we take some of this and that we have people like you in our country who are always the voice of reason, who always support um, everything that, that all the arguments with statistics and facts. So thank you very much for sharing all your knowledge and your insight with us this morning. It is so appreciated and so necessary. So it was lovely seeing you again online. Um, thank you for being with us. And thank you, Cor, as always, for organizing everything in the background. Enjoy your week, thank Doc. You. And enjoy enjoy your week to everybody else. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Bye-bye.